There were whispers that uh, while we were doing Hellraiser that, uh, that New World were getting so excited by what they were seeing when the rushes were going back to LA. Um, they gave us a bit more time and a bit more money at that point on Hellraiser and there were certainly whispers then that a sequel was, was uh, in the offing. But you hear that kind of chat all the time, you know, it's like doing a fringe play. There are always West End producers in. You're always transferring. Um, you hardly ever do, so you, you kind of dismiss um, those thoughts. But it, it, was, it was evident pretty quickly once the movie was out and it, and it garnered quite a wave of publicity and pretty good critical response and did very well at the box office. It was evident that there was going to be a sequel. I don't remember the exact point at which uh, I was directly approached about it, but I mean, the movie came out in 87 and we were back in front of the cameras in 88. Uh, to do Hellbound. It was clear that Clive was not going to direct uh, Hellbound, but I mean, he was, he was absolutely hands-on as an executive producer right the way through it. He was there all the time. So you, you meet the new director and you, you work with the new director. I suppose for me then, the, the task was to keep a hold on what we'd created with Pinhead in the, in the first place. But, um, Tony, Tony uh, absolutely understood the movies and, uh, and I had a good, solid working relationship with him. While we were doing Hellraiser, I was aware that the character had once been human. The English army officer somewhere in India, Indian mutinies, I guess, in the early 1920s. Um, and if, in fact, there would have been a few more scenes of that because, of course, we, uh, we'd moved on to Pinewood and we had a substantially increased budget from New World, except that Black Monday hit. Uh, just before um, the, the budget was transferred from LA to London, so we lost about a third of the budget. Um, and there would have been, I think, two other scenes uh, in the screenplay originally of uh, Elliot in an Indian street bazaar, locating the place he's looking for and doing the Hellraiser haggling thing. What's your pleasure, sir? And how much is it? How much do you think it's worth? All, all of that. Uh, and then going to the Quonset hut with him with, with the box. But those two scenes would have required two sets for establishing shots, so they bit the dust. There would have been a great deal more of that exploration of, uh, of hell um, uh, and, and the, the labyrinth that you get that one great glass shot that establishes the labyrinth with the black diamond lament configuration swirling in the background. And that's unfortunately all we get to see of it. There, there would have been a great deal more exploration and I, and I guess more exploration of the, the life of the, of the Cenobite. I didn't change my approach to playing Pinhead at all because as I said before, in, in my own mind, uh, just as Pinhead has n no understanding of being something called Pinhead, um, he certainly would have no notion of there being this guy called Elliot Spencer that he once was until the denouement of the movie when Kirsty presents him with the photograph. I remember. You were all human. <laughs> I've wasted many, many <laughs> minutes of my life, and I'm about to waste a few more, uh, in particular at conventions. Up goes the hand. Uh, Mr. Bradley, can, can you tell us what was so horrible in the, in the scene where Pinhead and the female Cenobite played surgeons? It was so horrible, it couldn't even make the unrated version. So here's the skinny on that. Um, Peter had written one of those little three sentence bits in a screenplay that you, that you glance over when you read it. Uh, Kirsty and Tiffany are running through the hospital and two gowned and masked figures come out of a room and one of them uh, says, what are you two girls doing here? You know this part of the hospital is off limits. As he speaks, uh, his mask fills with blood and pins begin to break through and 
he pulls the mask off, revealing Pinhead, and as he speaks, his voice changes into Pinhead's voice, and uh, Tiffany grabs Kirsty and they run. Uh, it's very, very simple uh, to read, and it's not very, very simple to film. Um, and I'd read it, and I'd thought, uh, what, what do they mean by masked? Um, because it's got to be an all all over mask, and I've got to not have pins on, um, or I've got to be human, but but it can't be me, otherwise I'll look like Elliot Spencer, and that will just be too confusing. Um, so we we came out on set, and they they put surgeons' gowns on us, and gave us surgeons' masks, which covered this much of you. And I remember saying, but how does this work? In the first place, I, I can only put the mask on here because there are pins between uh, me and, and the mask. And then the rest of this is Pinhead. And it's kind of obvious to Kirsty who this is. She's not going to hang around and, you know. Um, so you've got to have this strange kind of all over thing. Uh, um, and then you've got to cut away to do the blood filling and the pins bursting out before you cut back to a reveal of Pinhead. So we stood around um, and, and talked about it and tried and was evident it wasn't going to happen and it was never shot. And the, uh, the unit stills photographer, bless his heart, took a photograph of us um, and for some reason they put it on, on the cover of the unrated box, but it was Never filmed. Mostly my memories of Hellbound involve getting out of bed at three o'clock in the morning and being driven around the North Circular um, and arriving at Pinewood at four o'clock in the morning um, uh, and uh, being ready in makeup by nine o'clock in the morning and getting on set about four o'clock in the afternoon. That seemed to be the way that most days on Hellbound uh, panned out. Um, I, I, and I, re I remember one morning around 5 a.m. the unit nurse came round to give everybody um, vitamin B6 or vitamin B12 tablets because it's apparently what we all get deficient in when we're making movies because of early starts and long days and what have you. I don't know what the hell this was but it it hit me like speed uh, and I went completely crazy and I do remember at one point hanging out of the window of the makeup room at, at Pinewood um, uh, threatening to throw Jeff Portis's uh, filofax away um, and he did actually gaffer tape me to the to the makeup chair um, to make me sit still uh, the, the the only other occasion that I do remember on on a couple of moments off camera on Hellbound was terrifying the life out of a cleaner who was merrily mopping the floors and I came round the corridor on full makeup and she dropped her mop and ran and we didn't see her again so we assumed she asked for a transfer to a different bit of pine wood while we were there um, and then encounter with Barry Norman who was um, uh, he was doing his Hollywood Great series, which he used to introduce sitting in a director's chair. Um, and so he was looking for film sets that he could use to, to do, and, and, and he got hellbound. And uh, I walked out of my dressing room in makeup and costume, and as Barry Norman was coming down the corridor, and he, uh, uh, I think I definitely startled him. He explained he was looking for his raincoat, which didn't convince me at all. But I know Clive and Chris used that to their advantage because he'd been, he'd been a little bit snotty in his review of Hellraiser. Uh, and they gave him permission to use Hellbound. And then uh, uh, the, the, the apocryphal story is that they, they locked him in a room and said, why are you doing this? You're the most influential film critic in the, in, in the country and this is a British horror film. Why are you trashing it? Why aren't you supporting it? And he apparently admitted that's because he didn't, doesn't like horror films. And they said, well, that's no reason to give it a bad review. And I think we got a fairly decent review for Hellbound. <laughs> <laughs>